Today I want to talk about prayer. And in all my years of ministry, and I've served in ministry many years, I know I look like I'm probably 32, uh, maybe 35, you know, but I am actually a little bit older than that. I am actually 41. No, that's a lie. I'm like, I'm a little bit older than that. And, and <laughs> I'm praying to the Benjamin Button thing here. And I served in many roles from youth pastor to worship pastor. I was a worship pastor at one time and, and lead pastor. And, and one of the questions that I get all the time were, was really related to this, this question. And, and it's different variation of the question. Actually, I'm, I'm going to list it in four questions and I'll summarize it in one. The first question that I get all the time is, does God hear and answer all prayers? Question number two I get is, if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, why pray if he's going to do what he wants to do anyway? Question number three is, why didn't God answer my prayer? I prayed and my grandmother still died, or I pray. Or why doesn't God answer my prayers? Because maybe that's kind of where you are right now. And question number four is, is there an effective way to pray such that God will answer my prayers? Our anchor verse today is found at the end of James 5.16. It says this, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man has great power and produces wonderful results. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll let me download into people what you've downloaded into me. Lord, I pray for receptive hearts and who this message needs to hit. Let it hit them square in the center of their heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I'll start out real easy. The easy question, the first question that, that folks ask me is, um, does God hear all prayers? Does God hear all prayers? And the answer to that is yes. In Psalms 139, verse 4, it says, Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. Every single word, every single thought, everything, once it enters into your mind, God hears it all and that's a period, that's a full stop, that's the end of paragraph. Well, the follow-up question, if you were like Jonathan, if you're like me, a follow-up question was, well, okay, if God hears all prayers, does he answer all prayers? And to answer that question starts out one of the truths that I want to share with you today. God hears and answers every prayer. Underscore every Every prayer, God hears and answers every prayer. Truth number one. And the problem is that oftentimes we don't hear his answer. And the problem is we get really angry and we get frustrated with God. But the problem is not God. God is speaking the answer, but we're not hearing the answer. And the reason why we don't hear his answer is normally two reasons. One, we either drown out his voice. Or two, we don't recognize his voice. If God's speaking, if somebody's speaking, and you're not hearing them, it's because there's either too much noise around, or you literally don't recognize the voice of the person speaking to you. You know, in John 10, 27, it says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Another version says, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And by the way, let me tell you, buckle up this morning, because... Um, I'm going to do some teaching this morning because I really want you to understand this whole concept of how powerful prayer is, right? So um, take notes if you need to, because note takers are. There we go. And as Pastor Steve says, you know, note takers also go to heaven. So if you want to go to heaven, you know, take some notes there, right? But the reason why we don't hear his voice could be because there's just too much noise around us. We wake up in the morning and there's, you know, there's friends, there's, there's getting the kids to school, there's in the afternoon, there's soccer and practice and all this other stuff, there's Netflix, there's all these activities, and none of those activities necessarily is bad, but one of the things that activities do is that it creates noise, and noise tends to drown out what God is trying to tell you to do. If you don't have a time where you get into a closet or you get somewhere quiet, quiet to hear you're just talking to God but God's like you're asking me stuff and I'm telling you stuff but you ain't listening because there's just too much noise and so if you want to hear God's noise you got to get to some quiet place every day and turn off the radio turn off the TV turn off the friends turn off your husband and that woman you shouldn't say amen so loudly um, and get quiet 
The second reason why you may not be hearing God's voice is simply be, why you, because you don't recognize his voice. And this may hit somebody really hard. The reason why you not recognize his voice is maybe you're just not a sheep. Because my sheep hear my voice. And if you're not recognizing his voice, you got to check yourself. And if you never invited Jesus into your life to become the Lord of, his li uh, Lord of your life, I'm, I'm telling you that you're not a sheep. But today, you can be. Today is the day of your salvation. Prophetically, I'm speaking that over this church. The fact is that God answers every prayer. He answers every prayer with either one of three ways. A no, a yes, or a wait. He answers all three, always, 100% of the time. And our problem really isn't the question, why didn't God answer our prayer? Or why doesn't God answer my prayer? If we're really truthful, you know what our question is? Our, our question is, well, God, why didn't you answer the prayer the way I prayed it? Why didn't you answer the prayer in the time frame that I prayed it? Why didn't you answer the time frame in the, the, the time in the, in the format that I, that, I, that I wanted it? You see, God, I prayed for somebody. I prayed for somebody in my life. I prayed for this beautiful girl. And let me tell you how she's going to look. She's going to be 34, 24, 36, whatever that is. She's a brick house. And that's what we're praying for. And God's like, I didn't have that for you. You see, we're all in love with our own ideas. If we weren't in love with our own ideas, we wouldn't pray the way that we pray. Because we tell God exactly what it is that we want. So we're in love with it, with our own ideas. And we get disappointed and we get discouraged when it doesn't work out the way we want to. But I want to tell you that, did you know that it's the desire of God's heart to give you the desire of your heart? I'll say that one more time. Did you know that it's the desire of God's heart to give you the desires of your heart. He literally says that in Psalms 37. So if that's his desire to give me the desire of my heart, and it is my desire to get the desire of my heart, why ain't I getting the desires of my heart? And I want to tell you that God only tells us no on two occasions. It's not day and night. It's actually contrary when we pray contrary to his word and we pay contrary to his plan. I want to spend a few moments kind of tell you what that out. So, so let me give you an example of how God will say no to you. Say, for instance, uh, this would not be anybody in here because everybody in here is like, oh no, we would never do that. So say you're at work, right? And, you know, there's this, one of your coworkers, a really attractive guy, your girl, is a really attractive guy. And you think, man, this guy, his wife probably doesn't know how good she has it. Come on, y'all know that happens, right? They're like, she's like, that's a great guy. And then, if you start to pray, it says, God, she doesn't treat him right. I want that man for me. I'm going to tell you that God's going to tell you no. It, because it's contrary to your word. It doesn't mean that you won't end up with that guy. What I'm telling you is that God didn't give you that guy. And I'm going to tell you that, you know, you're like, oh my, oh my word, you know, like, uh, you know, God is into renewal and restoration and all that. So if that's your situation, let me tell you, God can turn what was meant for evil and turn it around for good. So, so you know, don't worry about that. But I tell you that God told you no, and you went ahead. Anyway, God doesn't do anything contrary to his word. The second thing that God will not do, will say no to, is anything that's contrary to his plan. I want to spend a couple moments defining what I mean by that. You see... God has a sovereign plan, and sometimes you see some Bible scholars will say, like, it is like God's sovereign will, his sovereign plan is all that. I just call it God's plan. And it's like, and it comes in two forms. There's this plan that he has for the world where he's orchestrated the world, and one of the clearest examples is that he knows the time and, and hour and the day when he's going to return back for his people. And we're going to preach a message series on that, Pastor T told me, later on this year or, or, or next year on end times. But he knows that he's coming back. There is no prayer that I would pray that would actually make him delay that time. That's his plan. He's coming back that time. He's like, you know, this is, I'm God and this is what I'm doing. But it doesn't stop me from praying around it. So true story. So up until the age of 19, I was, I was wilding out a little bit. Just, you know, things like I wasn't supposed to be doing and, you know, 
And, um, and so when I stopped, I was praying that the Lord would wait to come back till I got married. <laughs> so I was like, I was 19. I'm like, all right, God, you got to wait to come back till I get married. You know, just one more time, Lord. And, and when I started dating Donna, I'm going to tell you a true story. We were getting married on May 23rd. I was, God, you can come back May 24th. That would be great with me, but May 23rd, not May 23rd. You know, let's hold off to... I don't think God answered that prayer. I mean, it worked out, but I don't think... I think I didn't, I didn't change his plan anyway, right? But God has a plan for us as individuals also. And it's not like a, a little dot theory, right? I call it a dot theory where like God's orchestrated like every single detail. And it's like, if you put on the tie your shoelace with one extra knot, you know, you're outside of God's plan. You're outside of, that's not what I'm talking about. God has big plans for your life. He has plans that will make you prosper, right? He has, he has, he has big plans for you. And um, so when I was in college, I started, well, when I was in college, uh, I met this girl, and I don't think I told Donna I was going to tell this story. I met this girl, <laughs> and this girl was like really, really, really cute. She was from the Virgin Islands. She was short. <laughs> she was pretty. And man, I, I, like, I was really attracted to her. There was only one problem. She had a boyfriend in the Virgin Islands. It's not a little problem. But that was before I was 19, right? And I had, you know, what, what young people would say today, I had some riz, I had some, I had, you know, sauce, you know, I, Jamaicans would say I had lyrics. And, and so I got her to kind of go out with me. It was real casual, you know, hey, I'll show you around the United States, I mean, around Miami, whatever. And so we started going out, and, and after a while, she started acting like she wasn't my, she didn't have a boyfriend, which was just fine with me because, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, he was dead to me, right? He's gone, right? <laughs> and everything was going fine. I actually took her to church. Donna was my sister's friend. I took her home. Donna met her. I took her to church, introduced her to my family. It's like, it's all good. Until one day, she asked me to take her to the mall, which was not unusual. We went to the mall before. But I said, where are you going for this time? She goes, I'm going to go buy a gift for my boyfriend. Man, let me tell you, I was hurt. I was devastated. I was like, how could she? How could she? Like, like this is me. This is me. <laughs> and I asked God, and God said, no. He says, I have other plans for you. I have a plans for another one, another short one, who's going to be prettier. <laughs> I got a plans for another short one who's going to be smarter. I'm going to be a plan for another one who's going to be with you, going to be your rock. She's going to be your help meet. I have a plan for another one who's going to be, she's going to cheer you up. She's going to be your cheerleader. I have plans for you for another one. She's going to be your prayer partner. She's going to be your earthly rock. And she's going to help you prosper in mystery. The answer is no. Now I wish he would have told me that right then and there. All he told me is that, no, that's not the one. Well, she told me I'm not the one. <laughs> she was channeling God, I guess. You know, all of God's individuals plan for us are really plans for a bigger impact. You know, we think it's at this little thing, but God's like, no, 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 I'm doing something. And, 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 and we don't like that, no, but God's like, I'm doing something. He's like, I know it hurts, but I'm doing something. I know it's what you prayed for, but I'm, but I'm doing something. I, I know it's not what you imagine, but I'm doing something bigger. I'm doing something greater. But, but God, if you're doing something greater, can you tell me? God's like, I can't tell you. I won't tell you because if I tell you, you're going to try and mess it up. You can't handle it. You can't handle the truth. I get scenes of a few good men. You can't handle the truth. And that's what God's saying to us. You can't handle the truth. And sometimes we know on this side of eternity where we look in the rearview mirror and say, thank God, like this case, it took, no, no, it took about, about five years before I realized the no from that girl was the yes from my wife. It took five years. So sometimes God allows you to look in the rearview mirror and you see why. Other times, he's like, you won't get to see till you get to the other side of eternity. But my promises are still true. 
My promises. You may not be seeing it in your life, but, but this time it's a no because I'm doing something bigger. And we don't really like that. You know why? Because we're in love with our own ideas. Here's a fact that God would much rather tell us yes than he tell us no. And in his word, he talks about all the yeses many multiples of time more than he talks about the no's. Because God wants to give you yes. In fact, God guarantees a yes whenever what we're praying for is aligned with his plan, his word, his will, and his timing. Guaranteed 100% of the time, it's yes. And, and so, you know, he says this in Psalm 37, 4, he said, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. In John 15, 7, he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Two conditionals, but the guarantee of a promise. And right now you're saying, well, Gary, you've, you've explained what his plan is. And you've explained what his word is, but I'm not really sure what his will is. Teaching moments number three here. What is the will of God? How can I know the will of God? People talk about the will of God like it's some like, it's some, like elusive thing. Like, like, maybe like, there's the will of God. It's like you're trying to catch the will of God. The reality is that the will of God is right there in his word. All you got to do, if you don't know where to find it, just I encourage you, Google, will of God, Bible. <laughs> Quotes, will of God, Bible. Google God's will, Bible. Google's will of the Father, Bible. And see what comes up. It literally tells you what the will of God is. Here, let me read a couple of verses from me just doing that this week. 2 Peter 3, 9, at the end of it, it says, It is not God's will that for anyone to perish, but it is God's will for you all, for all of us to come to repentance, to turn around and follow Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, For this is God's will that you become holy and that you keep away from sexual immorality. The Bible is just telling you that. Here's one which I think is going to be applied to some people. Ephesians 5, 17 says, Therefore, do not be foolish. Another version says, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It is the will of the Lord, the will of God, that you don't get drunk on wine. Somebody says, Shh, good thing I don't drink wine, I only drink whiskey. No, it means do not get drunk <laughs> on the spirit that comes of drunkenness, which leads to debauchery, which means uh, you're doing stupid and bad stuff, stuff you regret. Instead, it is my will that you be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is my will that you speak to one another nicely with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. It is my will that you sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. It is my will that you always give thanks in every circumstances to the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my will. It is my will that you submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You want to know what the will of God is? He'll tell you right there what his will is. I, I'll sum it up this way because if you're like me, you know, like you need things nice and easy and then three points, right? The will of God is three things. Love God. Love others. It's in the way that you, 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 treat, you treat people the way Jesus intended and the way that Jesus demonstrated if you, it's how you treat your wife. Because remember I say that God says yes when you're in his will. How you treat a wife is a determiner of whether or not you get what God wants to give you. How do you treat your husband? How do you treat your kids? You know what, you know what else is? How do you treat the server in the restaurant? You know what else is good? How do you treat that girl that you think is cute but you know she, you, won't, you don't want to marry her? You want God to answer your prayers? God's like, line, line up with my will. Love God, love others, and live like Jesus lives. It's the lifestyle he patterned. He set the example. He set the teachings. This is what he did when he brought the kingdom of heaven, which really is the principles of heaven, the, the laws of heaven, the culture of heaven to earth when he came to earth. That's what it means when it says his kingdom come. It's God's culture he brought to earth. I want to tell you this, that none of this is possible without knowing Jesus and understanding who you are in Jesus. Understanding that you're saved for all eternity once you ask Jesus to come in and you can never, ever be unsaved 
ever again, no matter what you do, no matter what you do wrong today, no matter what you do wrong tomorrow, no matter what you do in the future. Once you've asked Jesus in, you are saved for all eternity, and you, you're a king's kid. You have all the rights of heaven bestowed upon you once you do that. Because when you understand and embrace that truth, what you'll find is that living your life after the pattern of Jesus just becomes easier and easier and easier. You don't have to try. It just flows out because of God's spirit is inside of you. You know, sometimes it's his plan. You know, his plan, his word, and his will are very clear. And in some situations, it's literally not so clear. You think you're doing all that, but like what's, like what's happening? I, I, everything I think about is it's, it's working. And in those cases, I say his answer is wait. I've done everything, and he's still not answering the way that I wanted him to. And he's saying, wait, it's just not my timing. It's not my timing, you just wait. And he's like, I got this, but you just need to wait. Just wait, I got it. And um, I'm working it out for good, as the song said. I'm working it out for good, according to his riches in glory. So if your question today is, if God is all-powerful and God is all-knowing, why pray if he's going to do what he wants to do anyway? I want to pause and I want to go back to something I said earlier. And I wasn't going to interject this, but I'll do that. You know, years ago, many, many years ago, I'd say probably seven years ago, give or take you know, a year or so, I began praying about something that was, I was really burdened about. And I pray this all the time, prayed, prayed all the time, prayed all the time. And, um, and it just wasn't, it just wasn't happening. And you probably can identify with your own situation where you pray, it's like, it's, it's just not happening. And I remember I pray, and it was a constant prayer, 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 prayer. And um, I was at a prayer meeting, and um, I was with Pastor T in the Church of the Highlands, we were at a prayer meeting there, and I was praying there. And it's like really clearly in my mind, I heard God said, I heard you. It's like right in my spirit. It was like, it was almost like it was audible. It's like, I heard you. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, after that, you know, he's like, you don't need to worry. I got this. So I rushed home expecting that everything was going to be fine. And guess what? It wasn't. But my prayers changed from that point. I started thanking God in advance for what he was going to do. And about a year and a half after that, that seed from that prayer started to grow into this little teeny seedling. And it popped up out of the ground, figuratively speaking. And it's growing. And it's growing. It's not a fully mature tree yet, but it's growing. And I see it. And every day I see that little seedling, figuratively speaking. I, 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 I thank God, I thank you that you heard me, man, and you always listen to me. I love you, Jesus. You're the best. <laughs> He's like that rapper. You're the best. All right. <laughs> but you know, I believe that if God's all powerful and all knowing, and you might be asked, why pray if God, God, God is going to do what He wants to do anyway? You know what? The reason why you pray if God's all powerful and all knowing, which He is, is because some things God is only going to give to you if you ask. Because asking shows dependency. Asking shows communication. Asking shows intimacy. Asking shows relationship. Asking shows trust. James 4, 2 says this. You do not have because you do not ask God. Like, all right, I mean, I'm not a theologian, uh, like, but I, I think I can understand it. You do not have because you do not ask God. Okay, I get that. You know, I believe that when we get to heaven... We're going to see storehouses filled with stuff that God had for us that we didn't get because we didn't ask for it. You're going to go and say, like, you're, like, you're like, what's all this stuff? It's like, man, it's all the stuff that you could have got but you didn't ask for. Because nothing is too big to ask God. So go ahead and, and ask God. You know, our anchor verse says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man has great power and produces wonderful results. Then someone asked me, I was talking to them about this and said, well, is there a way to have an effective prayer that produces wonderful results? I want one of those prayers that produces wonderful results. 
I, I got news for you. God hears and answers all prayers. There's really no formula because God hears and answers all prayers. But I believe that there's a pattern that if we remember this, it helps to align our will to his will. And if his plan is his plan and his word is his word and that's going to stop, then I only got to work with my will aligning to his will and me and my brain aligning to his timing. So I got to work on my will and aligning my will. And there's a pattern of prayer around that. You know, in Luke 11, Jesus' disciples saw him praying, saw Jesus praying. And any good Jewish boy would actually have to learn how to pray. There were prayers, there were set prayers for every season of the year, there were set prayers for every festival, and most of their prayers were like, God, you're this, God, I am this. God, you're this, God, I am this. But they saw Jesus praying in a different way that, that they had ever prayed before. By the way, you know, I was reading up one of these Jewish prayers and um, that they would pray. Listen to one of these prayers. It says, God, I thank you that I'm not a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. That's what they would pray. It's one of the prayers they would pray. It was, God, you, God, me. God, you, God, me. I am special. God, you're special. You made me special. All everybody else around me are heathens. And God would like, when Jesus was praying, Jesus was praying differently. Jesus wasn't praying any you know, a structured prayer. Jesus was praying unstructured prayer. He was just talking to his father. Jesus was talking to his father, not just in father and him, but he was talking about unity among people. He was talking about how do you treat one another and that the disciples would learn that. You see, our prayer, uh, the Jewish prayers before were exclusivity, but Jesus' prayers were about inclusivity and oneness and unity. And they saw that for some reason, Jesus' prayers seem to get more results than theirs were. And we have evidence of that in the Bible. And, and so one day they asked, you know, I can imagine them, you know, a bunch of guys get together and they're like, hey, you ever notice that Jesus gets more answers than we do? I would be asking that with my boys like, hey. And somebody said, why would you ask him how he prays? And so they went to him and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he taught them this pattern of prayer which, which you all know very well you know it says our father who's in heaven can you say it with me holy is the hallowed be your name your kingdom come will be done on earth keep going keep going yes keep going forever and ever amen how many of you know that, knew that prayer without me putting it up on the screen? All right, I see all these hands up in here. Did you know that, that when God, when Jesus taught this prayer, it wasn't, my belief, and I'll tell you why in a second, it wasn't his, his instruction necessarily. It's not bad, but it wasn't his instruction to memorize it. See, Jesus was teaching them a pattern of prayer, not a rote prayer that we repeat over and over again, even though there's nothing wrong with this prayer. It's a good prayer. But I believe that what a greater truth in this prayer is the pattern that's underneath this, and I believe that within this prayer, there are three things that you can emulate that will make your prayers more effective because it works with aligning our will to his will. Yes. All right? So remember I tell you that God always answers Every prayer that's in his plan, his word, well, those, those aren't changing. So it's in his will. So everything that we do to get more effective prayers is lying in our will to his, right? So the first thing, the first pattern that Jesus taught in this prayer was declaration, was to clear. He said, our father, which is another way of saying daddy. You see, we need to declare who God is and who he is to us. We literally need to declare that. That needs to become a pattern of prayer where we start out. By the way, worship songs are nothing more than prayers because that's what we do in all our worship songs. We declare who God is and who he is to, who he is to us. And that needs to be a part of the declaration. It says, he is my daddy. And, and I like the way it says, my daddy who is in heaven. My daddy who is big and he's holy and he's Big, uh, bigger than anything else, more powerful than anything, knows more than anything else. When you go to God like this, he's like, you know, like a little kid's like, you mess with them, he's like, I'm going to tell my daddy. 
By the way, that's what Donna does to me whenever I say something stupid and I anger her. She literally goes walking. She goes, I'm going to tell to God about you. She goes walking around the block, talking audibly. She almost got Baker acted one day. No, that's not true. You see, this, this, when we do this, it causes us to pause and recognize who is it that we're addressing. We're addressing the great God who has no rival. We're addressing a God who has no equal. <laughs> I was going to sing. Because here's a, anyway. We're addressing the uncreated creator who's both infinite and intimate. And when we pause to declare on, and reflect on who God is, we gain a better understanding of who we are in Christ and the authority that we have to approach the throne of grace. We get a better understanding that we come because we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us and we can approach the throne of grace and pray with confidence. The second thing that we do is surrender. Surrender our will. Surrender our will. When, when, when Jesus says, hey, you need to pray, your kingdom come. Let's, like, God, bring your kingdom to earth. You know, bring, bring it here. Let, let things be on earth like it is in heaven. Let things be in my life. I want your will to be done right now in my, in my world, in my life. Your will in my relationships. Your will with my resources. Your will with my plans. Your will with my schedule. It really is just a prayer of alignment. It's saying, God, line up what I want with what you want. Line my decisions up with the decisions that you would want me to make. And you know what this involves? This involves forgiveness. This involves repentance. Forgiveness that, you know, like, forgive others like Christ forgave us. And repentance. Repentance is not some fancy biblical word that literally means to turn around. Like, I'm walking this way. God is right here, and I'm walking here, and God's like, I want you to repent. And come dead in center to focus, fix our eyes on Jesus because he's the author and the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. He says, it says, you know, this is what we need to do. And so, and this prayer is a tough prayer. This part of the prayer, the pattern is really tough for us because you know what? If we're being really truthful, if we're in, being really truthful, we don't normally come to God, just come to God just to surrender. We normally come to God to be rescued. And we normally come to God to be rescued from the things that we should have surrendered in the beginning. We would avoid it if we would have surrendered. The third pattern in this prayer is acknowledgement. So it's declare, it's surrender, and it's acknowledge. It's acknowledging his goodness. And I'd say it's, it's for three things. It's all in the Lord's Prayer. If you dissect it, you'll see this. You, you're acknowledging his pardon, his provision, and his protection. You, you thank him for your pardon from sin. You're like, like, thank you, God. So every time you bring something up, because, you know, the, the, the passage says, the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us of our sin. He already gave you that once you accepted him. So it's really a reminder. God, I thank you for your pardon from sin. God, just forever. I can't lose it. All right? And, and that, that I have permanent forgiveness because of his sacrifice by dying for us. You thank him for your provisions. Give us this day our daily bread. You're thanking him for your provision that, that says that I got this from you. It's not because I'm smart because I was born smart. No, God made you born smart. And you also thank him for protection. Lead me away from paths of temptation, paths of unrighteousness to paths of righteousness. And that's a protection prayer, right? For directing us and for never leaving us nor forsaking us. But you know what this is overall? This is acknowledgement that we are totally dependent on him. We're surrendering our will to him and everything that we have. I call it a DSA prayer. But by the way, the prayer is called DSAP. And um, I, I made it up, right? It doesn't exist anywhere like, like oh, that's profound. No, I just made it up, DSAP, right? DSA. And, um, and to clear, surrender, acknowledge. Right? If you can't remember it, remember, don't start out asking, DSA. Come on. Don't start out asking. Every time you're going to petition God about something, don't start out asking. Start with alignment. Yes. And then come back to the asking, which brings us to the P. 
which is petition. You know, in that same passage of scripture, Luke 11, it's also really good to read things in context in the Bible because it, there's just so much more good stuff in there as you keep reading on. It's like, wow, that's there. So Jesus is teaching his disciples his pattern of prayer, and he literally gets to it. If you read in Luke 11, the whole prayer is in Matthew, Matthew 7, but in Luke 11, he gets to be almost to the end where you're like, I'm ready for the, you know, for years of the kingdom, and it's just not there. And Jesus goes in. It's almost like he stops, and he goes straight to an analogy. And I'm going to read the analogy that Jesus gave right after he said the Lord's, he taught them the Lord's Prayer. It's all in the same context, the same teaching lesson. He says this, Suppose one of you went to your friend's house at midnight and said to him, Amigo, friend, loan me three loaves of bread. It's midnight now. And a friend of mine has come into town to visit me, and, he has no, and I have nothing in the house to eat. If your friend inside the house answers, like, don't bother me, because it's midnight. Like, you can wait till the morning. Like, you know, I'm already locked, gone to bed, the kitchen shut up, I packed up everything, dishwasher's packed up. I'm not going to get up and get you anything. Come back tomorrow morning. It's not that serious. Verse 8 tells you, I tell you, if friendship is not enough to make him get up and give you bread, your boldness will make you get up and give you whatever you need. So I tell you, ask, and God will give to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. Everyone who asks, receive. And the one who searches will find. And everyone who knocks will have the door open. If your children ask for a fish, which of you would give them a snake instead? Or if your children ask for an egg, would you give them a scorpion? Even though you who are bad know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I'm going to wrap up with three points really quickly. See, Jesus went on and he gave this analogy, and he says, when you come to petition, you need to petition with boldness. You need to petition with boldness. And by boldness, I don't mean yelling and screaming, because that just brings attention to yourself. There's no yelling and screaming that's necessary. It's just you're, you're approaching with the boldness and the confidence that comes from a personal relationship with Jesus, and that I have a daddy who can make things happen. And for so many of us, we come with timidity. We don't come to God with boldness. We don't come with the boldness that he tells us to come to because of our position. And so we pray these really timid prayers. We pray these really unsafe prayers. You know why we do that? Yeah, and I, I'm guilty of that too at times. Is that we don't want to embarrass God. We don't want to put God out there and then it doesn't happen. I'm like, uh, I'm like let me tell you, God ain't going to be embarrassed. Put him out there. Put him to the test. And the other thing is that we are afraid that we will be disappointed. But you know what? It ain't up to us. It's up to God. And you pray, like he said, ask and ask with boldness and, and come forth and see what, man, you know, we got power. We got power to approach in boldness. It, the, the name that Jesus told us to pray with was the name of Jesus. Pray in the name of Jesus because his name is power. His name is healing. His name is life. And man, we need to start doing some name dropping in our prayers. Like we look at somebody who is sick and we can pray and say, God, please heal them. I pray those. But I tell you, it hits different when he says, in the name of Jesus, I command you sickness. I command you cancer to get out of that body. You have no place in this body. In the name of Jesus. That's a name drop. You know, sometimes at work, I, I have a, a position of corporate America, and I have a team, and sometimes they're going to a meeting and they're trying to convince some people to, to do something. And I'll come into the meeting on the phone, unannounced, and I hear them saying, well, Gary said. And I'm like, <laughs> they're talking about me, wow. And the name drop brings something. It's like you have your kid and, and your, your sibling, your kids, your kids, you have two kids and one kid says, go down and take out the garbage. It's like, Psh. daddy said, go down and take out the garbage. The kid's going to get up and go down because daddy said, we need to name drop or daddy said, sickness, you need to go. Speak of bonus. The second thing is 
We learn from this analogy that Jesus gave is speaking with, praying with petitioning with persistence. By persistence, I don't mean babbling over and over and over again in some super long prayer, just, you know, repeat. Like, God's not deaf. He heard you. But I do believe that there's something about consistency and persistency in prayer. Like the story I told you about, I didn't pray 18 hours a day for that thing, but I prayed almost every day that I could think of about that thing. I just kept coming back to it. It's like the guy, he's like, if friendship won't let him open the house and give you bread, your persistency will. He'll just get up and give you the bread. And you know, sometimes we don't have because we give up just too quickly. God is like, you know, one more prayer. And we don't have a problem going to the casino and dropping another dollar into the slots or on the app, putting another dollar in. You all know what I'm talking about with them apps and sports betting. But we give more credence to that betting than we give to Jesus. And we give up too quick. And God is saying to you this morning that sometimes you need to push to pray until something happens. Just keep pushing. Keep pushing. Sometimes it requires fasting, but sometimes you just need to keep pushing. Consistency. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man produces great results. The last thing I'll mention here before I close out, we need to petition with belief. Belief that God is not going to give you a scorpion when you ask for an egg. He may give you a whole chicken. You ask for an egg, he's like, God, I didn't get an egg. He's like, I gave you something that produces many eggs. It's just different, but it's better. It, it, we said, which one of you, if you ask God, he's not going to give you a snake instead of a fish. I know there's somebody in here who owns a big fish distribution business. But maybe one day he started out asking God for a fish. See, God is going to give you, at the very least, what you ask for. But at the very best, he's going to give you above what you can ask, think, or imagine. He's like, God, I never thought about it. How you came up with that? That was so much better than I asked for. That's what effective prayer is about. So I want to tell you, don't rush ahead of God. Wait to hear his instructions. Wait for him to do it. Every time we rush ahead, we make mistakes. And some of those mistakes goes on for, go on for our lives, and some of it goes on for generations. Just wait. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know, as I close this out, I want to tell you to not sleep on the power of prayer. Don't sleep on it. As God's child, you have a permanent right standing with God that gives you the same positional authority as Jesus. And by the way, if you ask Jesus, do you want to go to the cross? Jesus would have said no. So even Jesus got some things that he didn't really want, but needed. But you have the same positional authority of Jesus. And that positional authority is that you and you and you and you and you have the positional authority to call the supernatural into the natural and turn that natural thing into supernatural. You do because you have God inside of you, Jesus inside of you. And at the, end of it, at the end of the day, that's what our relationship with Jesus provides. And our relationship is the key to effective prayer. With all head bowed, I just, I just want to talk to you for probably going to be about another minute and a half. I want to pray for some people here today. There are two groups of people in this room. There's one group who you know Jesus and you've 
heard his voice, but for some reason in your situation, you're not hearing his voice. Or in your situation, you are not praying with the power that you need to pray with. I want to pray for you right now. And then I'll pray for the second group of people. If you walked in here, and Emma did it this morning, but if there's something that you're like, God, I need for you to do a miracle in my life, in my relationship, my kids, my job, my health, my finances, and you're praying and you're trying to line up but it's just not happening. I want to pray for you right now. If that's you, could you raise your hand? I just want to see hands. I see hands. I see hands. I see hands all over the place. Let me just pray right now. Father, I thank you, God, that you are who you are, all-powerful, all-knowing. Lord, I thank you that you are our daddy, our father. And that we can call upon you, Lord, right now, Jesus. Lord, I surrender everything that comes and stand in as barriers. Lord, whether it's will, whether it's whatever it is, Lord, that I pray that every person who raise their hands and every person in this room will just pray a prayer of alignment right in their hands. I said, Lord, align my will to your will right now. Align my will to your will right now. Align my will to your will. Align my will to your will right now. God, I thank you, God, for the power that we have in you. With Lord, I thank you, God, for your power of forgiveness. I thank you for your strength and your healing. And right now, Jesus, I pray that for every person who is lacking faith, Lord, Lord, that you instill an extra measure of faith, Lord. Let them realize that they are God's children. They're king's kid. They have positional authority and that they have the power to call you down and to name drop you into their lives and into their situation. I do that on behalf of them, but God, even, even greater than that, let them know that they can do it on behalf of themselves and everybody around them. I pray for power, strength, boldness, persistence, and belief. In Jesus' name. I want to pray for another group of people right now. So people who you may not hear Jesus because you've never made a decision to you can't think of a life where you've said, God, I want you to come in and I want you to rule my life. I want you to be in charge of my life. I want to live in a way that brings your kingdom to earth. If that's you, it was the key to unlocking God's voice. You recognize in God's voice. If that's you, why don't you raise your hand and I just want to pray for you. So what is room? Yes, I see that head over there. I see that head. I see that hand. Let me just pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that right now, where they are, they'll just say this prayer to you that I'm going to say. They'll repeat it and mean it. I'm just going to ask the people who raised their hand, not everybody, just right where you are, without any, doesn't, to yell it out, to say this. God, Jesus, Please come into my life and take full control now. I yield and surrender my life to you. I surrender my will to you. Lord, I receive the power of your Holy Spirit in my life. Thank you that I can now walk forth, forward with knowledge, with boldness, and persistence. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We are celebrating with you and we want to walk this journey together. And if you prayed that prayer or you want to know more about Jesus, follow the prompts that are on the screen right now. Our vision is God's vision for you and that's to see you live a better story, holy, healthy, happy and bringing heaven to earth. And if you've been impacted by what you hear, partner with us. Yeah, together we can make both an epic and an eternal difference. The giving options are coming up on the screen to share the love and see people meet Jesus and live that better story.
Hey, and if you're in the South Florida area, we would love to see you in person. Check out the description below for times and places where we can meet and we'd love to see you soon. Yes, where friends become family at History Makers Church.